stand up and worship with us this morning. Hallelujah, we worship you, God. You're worthy, Jesus. Have your way in this place today, God. Thank you, Jesus.
Hallelujah. We want to welcome everyone. Thank you for being in the house of God today. We are going to go to the, uh, the Lord right now with all the needs that we have. We know that there are several uh, families that are dealing with situations at this point. So if you're joining us online, if you would, put your prayer request in the comments so that we can pray for you now and throughout this week. If you're in the house with us, if you would, raise your hand to signify any needs that you're dealing with. Psalms 34 tells us that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. God, we honor you right now, Lord. We thank you for allowing us to be in your presence. And Lord, I know sometimes we're a needy people, but you're a great God and you always take care of us. God, I pray that you touch every person, every heart that's lifted up to you right now, online and here in the house. Touch, help, heal, be with your people right now. In Jesus' name, amen.
Come on, why don't we praise him right now? Thank you, Jesus. In the good and the bad times, in the shadow and the sunlight, I will praise your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a mighty, mighty presence of the Lord that's in this place right now. One more time, why don't we just give him a hand clap of praise. He's worthy. Thank you, Jesus. We magnify you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you all so much for being here this morning. What a mighty presence of God that's, that's in this house. If you weren't here in the first service, the presence of God was here, and we're expecting more of the same. Amen. Thank you to all of our guests for taking time to be with us. Uh, whether you're here in the building online, thank you so much for, for being with us this morning. And uh, as we continue to say, it's never been easier to evangelize than it is right now. Take your Facebook, social media, hit a quick share, help us get the word out. You don't know who you might bless with them hearing the word of God. Amen. And thank you always for being such a giving church. Uh, if you'd like to join us in giving this morning, you can do that. Uh, if you're in the building, you can do it at the kiosk in the back. You can also uh, do it online through the church app or text to give the number that will be on the screen there. If you have your Bibles, Exodus chapter 33, and as you're looking that up, remember a couple of important announcements. Don't come this Wednesday night because no one's going to be here. In lieu of Thanksgiving, we'll be spending time with family, fellowship, hopefully some good food and uh, relaxation. So enjoy time with your family. And then every year, don't we have a good time at the Christmas concert? We're going to have Christmas concert December the 12th at Saturday at 6 p.m. And then December 13th at 10 a.m. Mark that on your calendar. You don't want to miss it. We're going to have a great time. Exodus 33 and verse number 12. Moses said to the Lord, You've been telling me lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said I know you by name and you have found favor with me. If you're pleased with me, teach me your way so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. And the Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. Then the Lord said, there's a place near me where you may stand on a rock when my glory passes by. But I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. And I want to talk to you on this subject only, Jesus. Father, speak to us this morning. Help us hear and respond to your word, your, your living word that's longing to touch us today, God. In Jesus' name, and everyone say amen. And if you're going to help me this morning, you can be seated. If you're not, you can stand like I am. So uh, I'm taking it. I'm going to have some people get behind me this morning. Amen. We're in the final part of a little series called Time in the Tent where we've been looking at the importance of a daily relationship with God. And Wednesday night, we talked about the power of presence, and we talked about marriages and relationships with, with children and their parents, and kind of compared that to our relationship with God, and I, I really hope that kind of helped you out, gave you some tips on how to strengthen some relationships in your life, that we can't just be present but absent, we need to be present in the presence of God. And, and we talked about how we don't want God to just be a provisional God, we want Him to be the personal God in our life, that we're not in it just for blessing and reward. We're in this ultimately because we want the presence of God. We want to connect with Him in a real way. And, and I want to conclude this series by talking to you about the source 
about the blesser, the provider, the personal God that we talked about. And his name is Jesus. This is all about Jesus. Everything that we do is about him. The reason we get up in the morning and come to church so early is because we want to worship and magnify the name of Jesus. Because we believe that, that Jesus can do anything and that, that he gave everything for us. And we long to connect with our creator and to walk in his presence and feel him among us. So I'm doing something this morning that I, that I rarely do. I'm giving you the destination of the message before I give you, or before I even start the, the journey. I'm giving you the final point before I, I walk through the steps. Because if you don't get anything else that I say to you this morning, I want you to remember that it's all about Jesus. Everything hinges on Him. If you need healing this morning, it's found in Jesus. If you need salvation this morning, it's found in Jesus. If you need emotional security in your life, it's found in Jesus. If you need help or hope, it's found in Jesus. Whatever question you may have this morning, I'm going to tell you the answer is Jesus Christ. It's all in Jesus. So that's where I'm going, but, but let me backtrack and give you the foundation that I want to build this on. And that is that it's too easy for modern westernized Christianity to, to live in this area of comfort and contentment where we settle for an idea that we were saved just to follow rules and financially contribute and, and faithfully come to church. And, and that's pretty much the extent that, that we think we're supposed to do. But God has called us for so much more than, than just that. Thank you for doing that. It's an important part. But God has called us all to relationship. He longs to connect with us. Each and every one of you today in these chairs, He's longing to connect with you on a daily basis, on a real basis. And Solomon penned the words that, that are tragic. He said, I saw the wicked buried who had come and gone from the place of the holy. I saw people who came in and out of the presence of God, but they never really connected to the God of the house. And, and they came and they left and they came and they left and they were never changed. And, and somewhere in their, their natural wickedness and sin, they perished because they never found a true connection to the God of the house. And sometimes we stay at that level, but then sometimes we move beyond that level where we get to a, a place of occasional presence, a point of contact, but not really a true connection. God, I need you to show up now. I need you to help me now. I need you to heal me now. I need you to step into my, my current situation. And, and that's a good start. It's a good place. But I've come to tell you this morning that God wants to be so much more than just your, your now God that fixes your now problems. He wants to be the God that, yes, he'll fix the now current problem, but he wants to walk with you every single day. He, he wants you to understand you don't have to just have this moment of contact where he steps in, that you can walk in his presence and in his favor and in his power. You can walk in that dominion every single day of your life. Sometimes we move beyond the point of contact to this place that, like Moses says, God, just show me your glory. I, I want your glory moving in my life. I, I want more than what I have right now. God, I, I need more than I've previously experienced. I'm not being greedy. I'm not just in this for myself. God, I love you so much. I want, I long for more of you. Like, like Moses said, God, show me your ways, not just so I can have more knowledge, but God, show me your ways so that I may know you and that I can please you. It's like a, a, a lover that's wanting to please the one that they care about. I want to know more about you so I can know what it's like to make you happy. It's like the husband telling his wife, just, just, just give me a little bit more details. Help me out a little bit so I can know what makes you tick, what, what makes you happy in this life. This is Moses when he steps into the situation. He's like, God, show me your glory. Show me a little bit more so that I can, I can please you better, so that I can live this harder, so that I can be in your presence more. I want to be what you want me to be. God, show me your glory. And I believe that God is calling us to be that kind of church. I believe as I'm looking out at you this morning that God is calling each of you to be that kind of person that we're not just satisfied to, 
come to another church service and check a list and, and check something off our, our box. But, but God, I, I'm not just here so I can get a blessing. God, I'm here because I want more of your presence. If I don't connect with you, nothing else really matters. God, I need your presence in my life. The problem is that this kind of attitude toward God requires a complete and total dependence on him. It takes more than just talent. It takes more than the right building blocks in place. It takes more than the right leadership structure and the right programs in a church. It, it takes a hunger for more of God in our everyday walk with Him. So I'm going to publicly proclaim this morning that I'm honored and grateful to serve with a pastor who strives for excellence in every area that I just mentioned. He tries to put the right leadership in place and the right programs, and he, he's constantly looking for innovative ways to spread this gospel and propel us as a church to the next level. His desire is to continue to grow this into something that glorifies and magnifies Jesus Christ. And, and while I'm grateful that we are striving to be excellent in all of those areas, what I'm most grateful for is that at the end of the day, when we have done everything that we're able to do, when we've given it our best and we've tried everything that we can, our pastor still stands up here week after week and tells us things like, God can do the impossible. Whatever you need in your life, God is able to perform it. He stands up here and tells us things like, like we have to chase what matters. If you want better marriages, the answer is not, not, not no, go try something else. The answer is you need to put God in the center of your marriage. If you want to have a more successful career, the answer is put God in the center of it. If you want to do better at school, the answer is put God in the center of it. Whatever you're, you're needing to do better at in life, he's telling us the answer is to pursue Jesus Christ. And in your pursuit of him, you will find that he is pursuing you. We need to pursue Jesus. I'm thankful that our leadership is leading us in this way that lets us know that, that we have to do everything we can to connect with God on a daily basis. God, above all else, show us your glory. Show us your glory. And it's funny to me in this, this text that Moses has been on the mountaintop and he's been experiencing God for himself. He's received the Ten Commandments and as he's about to come down from the, the mountain with the Ten Commandments, the people have kind of gone crazy. They've built a golden calf. They're, they're, they're partying around the calf doing all kind of crazy things. And, and God gets really, really upset. And I know he was upset, she's not in here so I can talk about her, because he was acting like Corey. <laughs> you see, Corey has this thing where when she's talking about Hudson and Graham, our, our two kids, she, she always says, my boys. Like, my boys did this, or my boys said that. And, and I'm like, unless you know something that I don't, that's my kids too. So, like, it, it should be our boys. Like, like our boys but, but it's always to her, it's like, my boys, unless I've been gone and I come home and they've been acting up. And then I walk in and she's like, you need to get your kids. And it's like, oh, oh so now they're my kids. <laughs> now they're mine. And, and, and God was really upset because God looks down at Moses and God says, you need to go get your people because they're acting a fool down there. Those people that you brought out of Egypt, you need to go get them. And, and, and Moses has to remind God, God, I'm just doing what you said. Like I was just minding my own business in the wilderness and this bush starts talking to me. And you called me to go to Egypt and get those people. And so he, he works the situation out with God and, and then he comes down and he fixes the situation down on the mountain and he, he, he has this tent of meeting where he's in this, this awesome prayer meeting with God and the cloud descends and, and he leaves and Joshua's alone in the tent. He stays and lingers in the presence of God and we talked about that and now I'm going to pick up with Moses as he's walking away from this meeting that he's had with God. He continues the conversation and he's like, God... You need to remember, I'm reminding you again, these are your people. They're not mine, they're yours. And if you want me to do a good job leading them, you're going to have to walk with me. If you're not walking with me every step of this journey, all the stuff that we've done is going to be for nothing because it's going to stop right here because I can't lead them where we're supposed to go. All the stuff that you've told us we're going to have, I can't do this unless you stay in the middle of it. And God's like, 
No worry, Moses. I got your back, bro. It's me and you. We're, we're straight. I'm going to walk with you every step of the way. I'm going to give you rest. I know you, you're worn out and you're frustrated and you're tired and you're weary and you're stressed, but I'm going to be your rest. My presence is going to walk with you. I don't know about you, but that excites me in this chaotic, crazy world that we live in with all of the stress and the anxiety that God steps in and says, I will be your rest. My presence is with you, and my presence will be enough to get you through it. And Moses hears this. He hears the God of the universe say, I'm going to be with you. My presence is with you. But, but there's something within Moses that it's, it's the, the word of God has come to him, and it's like it's not enough in this moment. Moses is like, yeah, but don't make me go by myself. You have to come with me. You, you, you have to come with me. And if I was gone, I probably would have zinged Moses a little bit right there. Because it's like, I just told you, I'm with you. I'm going to give you rest. I'm going to be with you. My presence is going to be the power that you need to get where you need to go. W weren't you paying attention to what I just said? But, but this is important to Moses. And Moses doesn't let this go. It's like me when I have this friend that I won't name, but he's here this morning. And I have someone else that's going to drop me off at, at, at a place. And I'm depending on this friend to come pick me up. And so it's like, hey, man, you, you're going to get me. He's like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to pick you up. And it's like, all right, you know they close at 8, right? Yeah, I, I, I'm going to get you. All right, um, what time are you going to be there? I'll be there by 8. Okay, man. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, so you sure you're going to be there? I don't have to call anybody up. I'm going to be there, man. I, I got you. It's like, okay, cool, cool. You sure? No, I'm not coming. Find somebody else because you're getting on my nerves. And this is kind of Moses' approach with God. He's like, yes, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to, to walk with you. I'm going to be your peace. And Moses is like, yeah, but, but are you really going to be with me? Yes, I'm going to be with you. Yeah, but, but are, are you going to walk every step of this journey? Yes, I'm going to be with you, Moses. Moses has to have this assurance, God, I need you to be there. And God's like, yeah, I'm, I, I'm with you, Moses. And aren't you glad to be serving the kind of God that, that isn't worried or bothered by your insecurities? That no matter how many times you have to come back because you're worried and you're frustrated and you're upset. God, I know what you said, but I also know what it looks like. And it doesn't look like what you said. So I just need you to tell me again, are you sure you're in this? And God doesn't, doesn't smite us down like we weren't paying attention. God says, yes, I'm with you. I'll persuade you again. I'll convince you again if you'll just get in my presence. I'm glad to be serving that kind of God. And so God answers the question and says, yes, Moses, you're not in this alone. I am with you. I am pleased with you. And I know you by name. And that's cool. God knows my name. That, that, that's awesome. God knows my name. So you, you start thinking, well, isn't God omniscient? Like, like doesn't he know everybody's name? <laughs> so why is that so cool? Like, God, God knows us all. He knows everyone's name. So why is it so special that he steps into the situation and he tells Moses, I'm with you. I'm pleased with you. I know your name. Because this isn't just a general statement by God. It was a definite sign of affection. In that culture, it was a person's name had had strong significance it carried great value and meaning and when God steps into this and says I know your name it was a, a cultural colloquialism that basically meant God I, I, Moses I've separated you you're different than everyone else you have great value to me he talks about an intimate and a personal connection and what we see is that when we spend time in the tent, when we stay in the presence of God we find a God that says I'm getting personal with you we talk a lot about, I want to get personal with God, and I, I want to show myself to God, and I want to give myself to God. But here we see a God that says, when you spend time with me, I want to get personal with you. I want to reveal myself to you. I want to connect with you. I want to get to know you. That's an awesome, awesome God. And we learn that God is, is pursuing us 
when we begin to pursue him, the scripture says that, that if you'll take one step, he'll take two. That he's going to come and, and try to track you down when you begin to pursue him. And Moses is like, sweet, I'm on a roll now. Like he, he's just going, God's just going with it. He's just answering my questions. He's just, no matter what, he's, he's just going with it. And so he said, God, I've got one more thing that I have to ask. Now imagine the audacity of this man named Moses standing in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's been pushing the issue, and now he has one final request. God, show me your glory. Show me your glory. And that's an interesting request because when we hear this request, we often think of the miracles, the signs, and the wonders, and the powerful display of God's presence. Show me your glory. I want to see heaven kiss the earth. I want to see impossible things happen. I want to see the supernatural touch the natural. Show me your glory. And yes, we long for those things. But this is important because that's not what Moses meant. Moses said, show me your glory. And he wasn't talking about more powerful displays of God's presence. Moses had already seen countless miracles. Pharaoh's daughter had been his deliverance. That was a miracle. The burning bush had been his conversion and his calling. That was a miracle. His hand had, had been lepr leprous when he stuck it into his bosom. He pulls it out and it's, it's healed again. And he had tossed a stick on the ground and the stick became a serpent. He picked, he picked it up, the serpent, and the serpent became a stick again. He did it in front of Pharaoh and Pharaoh's magicians did it. And then Moses' serpent devoured all of their serpents. Another great miracle. And then he picks it up and it becomes a stick one more time. He's called frogs into the land. He's called, caused the, the, the water to turn to blood. He's created lice and locusts. He's the firstborn of all of Egypt has died. Everyone who didn't have the blood applied to their doorpost. He's watched the enemy drown in the Red Sea right after they walk across on dry ground. There's been a fire that's guided them by night and a cloud that's guided them by day. There's been miraculous manna from heaven. There's been water that's come from a rock. There's, there's been shoes they've been wearing that never wear out in the midst of a desert. Moses had seen the miracles. And Moses had lived in the miraculous. He wasn't asking God, show me another miracle. He wasn't asking for just a greater performance in this moment. He's saying, God, show me something else. I've seen what you can do for me. I've even seen what you can do through me. But God, today I'm asking, just let me see more of your presence. I just want to know you. God, I just want to connect with you. And I compared it earlier. It's kind of like the, the teenager. I'm, I'm using this example to keep it on a PG level. But it's like the, the young teenager that's kind of been talking to the, his girlfriend for a little while. And he's ready to go to that next level. And it's like, should I ask her? Can I hold her hand? Or should I just go for it, man? Like, like what should I do? And this is kind of the, the, the picture we see of Moses. Is, I, I, you've been talking to me like you're my friend. But I'm ready to take this to another level, God. I'm ready for some more intimacy with you. I'm ready, God, for something greater and deeper show me more about yourself singer Cody Carnes says it perfectly I'm caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessing. Jesus, you don't owe me anything. More than anything you can do, I just want you. I just want you. And then he says, I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry when I forget that you're enough. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. Not more blessing, not more benefit, not more promise. God, I just want your presence. Moses was saying, God, I just want a deeper revelation of who you are. And we see that this is the context that God understood it in. Because when Moses says, show me your glory, God doesn't say, okay, Moses, what miracle would you like for me to perform now? God, what, what, do, you want, what do you want from me now, Moses? 
I'm the genie in the Bible coming back. How many wishes would you like this time? No, no, that's not God's response at all. God says, okay, I'll, I'll do that for you. I'm going to let my goodness pass by. He understood Moses was saying, I want to connect with more of you in a real way. And the imagery that we see is one of God removing his robe, God unveiling himself, God allowing part of his presence to be seen by a man. And his holy presence passes by and Moses is allowed to see part of it when he's hiding in the cleft in the rock. I want to encourage you this morning, let go of your expectations. Whatever you thought was going to take place in this service, whatever you thought was going to happen from this moment on, forget about what you expected and say, God, I just want to connect with you. That's all I want to do is connect with you. I'm not here just to get a blessing. God, I just need to connect with you. Do something, God. Let me see a part of you this morning that changes the trajectory of my life. Put something within me this morning, God, that helps me walk with you every day. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. But what is his glory? Maybe we don't pursue the glory of God because we don't really have a full understanding of what the glory of God is. So I'm going to try to show you the glory of God that was talked about so much in the Old Testament. I want to show you in the New Testament the glory of God. In Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 36, and you can read them later. I'll just summarize Peter, James, and John have gone up a mountain with Jesus and a cloud descends on the mountaintop just like it had with Moses. And Jesus' face changes, the countenance changes just like Moses' face had changed on the mountaintop when he had been in God's presence. And then all of a sudden two men appear by Moses Eli or, or by Jesus, Moses and Elijah. And Peter in his excitement is like, we should build three shelters. We should build one for Elijah, one for Moses, and one for Jesus. And then something begins to happen in this cloud that, that's hovering. And as this cloud changes the situation, the disciples actually become afraid. And then this voice speaks to them from the cloud and says, This is my son in whom I am pleased. Listen to what he's going to tell you. And then the disciples look back to where Jesus had stood with Moses and with Elijah. And Mark records it this way in, in Mark 9 and 8. He says, suddenly when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone. And they saw only Jesus. Only Jesus. Jesus. You want to know the story was paralleling the story of Moses where the glory of God was manifested to Moses because God was trying to get everyone to understand. You want to see the glory of God revealed. The glory of God is fully consummated in the man Jesus Christ. If you want to see the glory of God, the glory is found in him. That's why the scripture says Jesus said I have all power under heaven and under earth. I am the full personification of the glory of God. And let me just take it a little bit deeper to convince you. The tabernacle plan was given with very specific instructions. Very specific details because every part of the tabernacle plan pointed toward Jesus Christ, the coming Messiah. And in this plan, there were the outer courts where the sacrifices were made and in the outer courts, the light that illuminated the place was the natural sunlight. And they would do the duty with the light of the sun. You go further into the inner courts and there was candlelight in the inner court where the priests could do their duties. It was how they could see. But when you went beyond the veil into the holy of holies, there was no windows. There was no candles. There was nothing to illuminate the room. There was just the presence of God that sat on the mercy seat on the ark of the covenant. The glory of God was the light behind the veil. Now watch this. I'm going somewhere. Give me a moment. I'm going somewhere. In the book of Genesis chapter 1, we see there's darkness and void up on the face of the earth. And, and Jesus or God speaks and says, let there be light. And boom, there's light across the entire universe. There's light. And then we get a little further on in the story and says that he created a greater light to rule the day and a lesser light to rule the night. And we know that the greater light is the sun and the, the lesser light is the moon. And it says, and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. The question then is, what was the light that illuminated the entire universe from the moment that God speaks until the fourth day when he creates a sun and a moon? What is the, the, the light of the entire universe? I'm going to submit to you that it was the glory of God. 
Because Revelation 21 and 23, John is talking about heaven and he makes this statement. The city has no need of sun or nor moon for the glory of God illuminates the city. There's no need for, for sun or moon in heaven because the glory of God is so radiant that, that it, it, it illuminates the entire city. Now look and read the next part. And the Lamb is its light. The Lamb slain from the foundation of the world is the light. The glory that is the light. It's revealed that the glory is the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. It illuminates all of heaven. Jesus is the completion, the full revelation of God's glory. So when I say, God, show me your glory, what I'm really saying is, Jesus, I need to connect with you in a real way. And when you connect with Jesus, you're getting more than Moses got when he was in the tent and the cloud descended. You're getting more than Joshua experienced. Matter of fact, the, the Bible says that, that all of creation, that the angels and the prophets of old all desire to look into what we have right now. That when we stand in the presence of God and we're filled with his spirit and the Holy Ghost moves upon us we get the glory of God put within us we get the full glory and the full package that all Old Testament prophets and even the angels long to look into the power of the glory of God the early apostles taught salvation is found in no one else Acts chapter 4 and verse number 12 says there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must, we must be saved. Colossians 3 and 17 says, And whatever you do, whether it's in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Philippians 2 and 9 says, Therefore God exalted him, talking about Jesus, it says, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. His name is Jesus and it's all about him. Mark said it's only Jesus. 2,000 years ago, the disciples got this revelation of the power of the name of Jesus. They went everywhere and they preached and they taught about his name. By his name, demons were cast out. By his name, the name of Jesus, sickness was healed. By his name, that name of Jesus, the dead was raised and the blind eyes were open and cripples would walk again by the powerful name of Jesus. And I've just simply come to remind us this morning that that name still has all power to heal, to save, and to deliver. That only Jesus can save. Only Jesus can mold, take something that's broken and put it back together. Only Jesus can rearrange a destiny and a future. Only Jesus can put a struggling marriage back together. Only Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Only Jesus took stripes on his back for my healing. Only Jesus is the hope of all of mankind. It's only Jesus. Jesus. Looking back, I remember all throughout my life and service, after service, singing about the name of Jesus. And as we would begin to sing, something would begin to take place and the atmosphere would literally begin to change just at the mention of his name. We used to sing songs like, when my troubles surround me, I didn't have to despair. Lord, you told me you would be right there. It seems like all my problems had just begun, but I don't have to worry no more. They were already one. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. Oh, how I love calling your name. Jesus. Jesus. Every day your name is the same. And then the verse would go something like, I remember the time when I felt so all alone. All, when I needed you, Jesus, all I had to do was call. Sometimes in the morning, sometimes late at night. But when I got off my knees, Jesus, everything was all right. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, I love calling your name. Then we'd, we'd slow it down sometime and we'd just say, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, oh, there's something 
about. Sing it with me, that name. There's something about the name Jesus. We get to the part, let all heaven and earth proclaim kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. Then we'd, we'd feel a little joy in our soul and, and we begin to sing something about the name Jesus. Something about the name Jesus. It is the sweetest name I know. And then we'd say, some people say I'm crazy, but I can't explain the power that I feel when I call your name. It feels like fire shut up in my bones. The Holy Ghost is moving and it won't leave me alone. At the name of Jesus, every knee has got to bow. But you don't have to wait till the fire falls. Go ahead, shout and praise him now. There's something about the name Jesus. Then we'd say, filled with wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath, and living water. Such a marvelous mystery. Then we'd say, you have no rival. You have no equal now and forever. God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a wonderful name it is. One of my favorites, we would say, there's power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. Whatever you walked in with this morning, there's power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, to break every addiction, to heal every sickness. There's power in the name of Jesus. And then sometimes, like Moses, as we all stand, sometimes, just like Wednesday night, we sing about it. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. And we say, chains fall. Fear bow. Hear now. Jesus, you change everything. You change everything. Let's magnify him. Let's lift him up right now in this place. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let's praise the name of Jesus.
thank you so much for being a part of our Point Church worship experience. We believe that the same presence we felt here today is the same presence that filled whatever space you're in. If you had an experience with God, we'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions about what you may have experienced, we'd love to connect with you. You can email us at experiencegod at point.church or you can go to our website, point.church, and there you can click the Experience God link and fill out a short form. Again, thank you so much for being with us. We look forward to hearing from you and we cannot wait to worship with you again.